I know you've made a mistake. And we all have. It's common in Blender. So let's look at 10 common mistakes and how to fix them in Blender. First up is box modeling. Something I see beginners doing a lot is being overly reliant on box modeling. And box modeling is when you take the cube and you add a subdivision multiplier. And then within edit mode, you can kind of add edge loops and other things to build out the shape of whatever it is you're trying to model. And this isn't inherently bad. I've used it in some of my tutorials, but where it becomes problematic is when you become overly reliant on it and you're adding edge loops for creases, then when you go to apply, you'll end up with kind of rough topology and not even topology. In reality, you should be using your subdivision modifiers on an object or model that already looks pretty similar to the final project and rather just using it to add some detail and smoothing. Ingons are any face with more than four sides and they can result in shading issues or deformation issues. Now, most people know this, including beginners, but not many people know how to fix them. There are actually some pretty simple guides online and exercises that can help you. Here you can see we have a basic one-to-one -one setup and from here, a three-to-one setup, you can see how that works as we begin to break that out so we maintain our quad structure. And from here, you can see a four to two. I found this handy guide online. So I'll go ahead and put this credit link in the description below so you can reference this. And if you're looking for more of a deep dive into ingons and how they work, I will also link to this awesome art station post that goes in depth on ingons and how they can kind of pull and tear at the shading in your object. The next thing I see a lot of people doing is not packing their UVs properly. So you can see here where I have a complex scene, I'm gonna be doing a lot of UV unpacking. It's gonna really matter how I utilize that space. So if I come over here and take a look at one of these objects, if I tab into edit mode here, this is the default view for Blender's UV. And you can see that there are a lot of blank spaces here that are being wasted. And I can go up here and I can go to UV, and I can pack islands and it'll do a little bit better. However, Blender's pack islands is okay. I recommend this add-on. They're not a sponsor or an affiliate, but I just recommend them. It's called UV Packmaster 3. If I go ahead and use that, you can see now that we're utilizing all of that space. And the more space that we're using that there, the more texture resolution we're going to get and the better our image is going to look. Now, the next thing I see a lot of people doing is what I'm going to call flat textures. And that's where they take an asset pack like my own here, which is the crafty asset pack, and they just grab those materials and just drag them onto objects into their scene. But really these materials are meant to be a starting point. You need to add variations into your maps. You need to consider dirt, grunge, buildup, wear and tear. And those type of things are going to take your PBR materials and create much more realistic renders. I have plenty of videos already covering how to achieve some of these kind of texturing effects. So check those out if you're interested. Now, something I see a lot of people doing is trying to light their entire scenes with an HDR. So you go up, you import an HDRI up here and then you turn it on. And then a lot of people, that's where they stop with their lighting. However, oftentimes this is gonna result with bland, boring lighting. You want control over your lighting so you can direct your subject and your composition. So I actually recommend that when using an HDR, take it down to something by 0.25 or 0.15 so you can get some of those reflections and fill lighting, but then go ahead and start adding lighting into your scene with various lights so that you can create a more dramatic and focused setup. Now, I already have a video on how to do lighting, so check that out if you want more information. Now, this is a big problem I see within the entire Blender community, and that's not modeling at scale. And I think that's largely to do because for a long time, Blender's unit scales were just like a made up system. And this can affect things like your depth of field. So if I go ahead and take this camera here, turn this way down, you can see I get a shallow depth of field, but as I scale this up, you can see more things are going to kind of start to come in and out of focus depending on the scale of the scene. Likewise, the size of your lights are also going to play a role in the look of your scene. You can see here if I take this big area light and bring it in and then scale it down, how drastically that can affect the lighting. Blender Guru actually covers this in detail in his Lighting for Beginners course that he has for free on YouTube. So I highly recommend checking that out for more information on lighting and sizes and how they play a role in the effect. Now, another thing I see a lot of beginners doing is they render everything at their scene at once and ignore the fact that we have this great layer system up here with compositing. By breaking up our renders, we can render more complex environments on machines with less memory. So this is great if you don't have just a beast of a machine to render through scenes. And I think part of the reason people don't know about this is because up here, this filter section, it's toggled off by default, but we have these holdout masks and then we also have this indirect only. So for example, in this scene, what I did is I went ahead and rendered out these background hills as a 2D image plane. And the way I did that is I went up here. I went up here and I turned on all of these to be indirect lights so that the only thing that showed, and what that allowed me to do was render out these hills, but they still kind of maintain the shadows and indirect lighting of all the objects around them. And then you can break that up into multiple layers and composite them back together. Now, by breaking up into layers like this, you can actually reduce 
the memory overload and actually render larger scenes on lesser computers just by splitting it up and putting it back together. Now, one thing I see people doing a lot is that they will create an armature for the character and then they will use automatic weight painting and stop there. Whereas automatic weight painting should be a starting point, not a stopping point. The automatic weight painting is great for general humanoid characters. Anything unique is going to need custom weight painting, but even with those general humanoid characters, you're gonna to wanna to go in and tweak things. Blender actually has some great weight painting tools. We can draw and remove and we can blur. We also have this cool ramp tool that makes it easy to kind of ramp up our weight painting. And then we can also go up under the menus here and blur the weight paints as well. I have a couple rigging tutorials as well on my channel for free where I walk through weight painting and those as well if you want more in-depth guides. And finally, I see some people being too reliant on add-ons. Now, I don't wanna smear any add-ons, so I'm just gonna show my artwork while I talk over this section, but I love add-ons. I use a lot of add-ons and I use them on every project, but I see some people going to the store, buying a bunch of add-ons and then just using them to kind of generate a bunch of stuff into their scenes, and that's great for certain things, but oftentimes it can lead to generic looking scenes without much of your touch on it. I think add-ons are great for enhancing your scenes and enhancing your workflow, but try not to let them be your entire workflow. So that was 10 mistakes I oftentimes see in Blender. I'm thinking about doing a specific series, 10 modeling mistakes, 10 texturing mistakes. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Next up, I've noticed a lot of people are just using the default render settings, which are a great catch all. However, there are some things you can do to optimize them for your scene. First up, of course, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you have your GPU enabled, assuming you have a GPU to render on. But up here, normally it'll say feature set supported. If you change that to experimental, you can get access to some other features, including adaptive subdivision with the subdivision modifier, which is great for displacement maps. Likewise, you can tweak the sample settings. I find that in the viewport, the denoise optics works best, and then I tend to use the open image denoise for my final render. And depending on your scene and your computer, you can set this max samples lower, of course, but the noise threshold, you can actually set to 0.1 and if you're using denoising, you're not gonna see a huge difference on your renders. Coming down to light paths, the max bounces is set to 12, and a lot of times you can get away with eight and even turn off things like transparent and volume if you don't have those objects in your scene. Under the performance setting, you have the threads mode, which will set to auto detect if you're using a CPU, but down here you have use tiling for GPU rendering. You'll wanna make sure use tiling is checked on and change your tile size. For example, if you're rendering a 1080 square image, this 2048 is going to just waste space, so go ahead and reduce that. Also, go ahead and turn on persistent data if you're doing animation. This will cost more memory, but assuming you have the memory space to use, it will render faster as it saves that data for upcoming render frames. Lastly, under the color management tab, you may notice that sometimes your images looked washed out. That's because we're using the filmic space by default, which is great for realistic lighting and colors, but can create that washed out look. They'll have some preset LUTs here you can use. I recommend medium contrast or medium high contrast to add a little bit of pop back into your objects. If you're wondering how I'm able to play back this animation in real time with Cycles render preview on and no lag, that's because NVIDIA was kind enough to provide me with the GeForce RTX 4090 graphics card, and it's an absolute beast in the viewport and on final renders. But anyways, let's move on to the next object. 